Thank you very much for, uh, for joining us to be the final one on season one of the 101st interview series. Um, for those of you watching that have been watching the interview series before, you'll know kind of what this is all about now. And safe to say there's no need to introduce this one because it's all in the name. Um, but it's my little brother, Henry. I'm sure people that are watching this have, have heard of Henry's story or, or know about it. But hopefully in this interview, we'll give you a bit more insight and detail into it and hopefully being uh being brothers will attack it from a, a slightly different angle so h as you know with 101st what we're trying to do is is use the power of incredible real life experiences to drive change so everything we do is is based on uh, an experience and using that as a framework to drive change with whoever it, it might be now your experience is uh is pretty incredible in itself and so i suppose a good place to start is if you could just kind of fairly high level, just talk through your experience. So actually what, what's happened, how they happen, and, and kind of the situation you're in now. Yeah, so back in 2009, I was just on a holiday with my mates in Portugal. And one of the kind of fourth, fifth day of holiday, mucking around on the beach, chucking a rugby ball around as we had done the previous days. And, you know, it's middle of summer, it's boiling hot, we decided to go cool off in the water. And where we've kind of run in, I went in a slightly different part to where my friends went in, into the water where we run into the sea, where I thought the seabed would just kind of continue to trail off. It kind of kicked up a bit. So I just dived forward to what I thought was a good depth, but caught my head on the seabed. And yeah, from that moment on, everything, everything changed. I opened my eyes expecting to get up and just walk out the sea and join my friends back on the beach again, but opened my eyes, just completely unable to move, just lying there and lying there in the sea. And yeah, from that moment, it was, you know, things got kind of crazy. I was dragged onto the beach by my friends where an ambulance was called. Then I was put into, put into that, driven to a, a field, I think, or somewhere, and then airlifted to, from the South Portugal up to the middle to Lisbon, where I was in the hospital for um, two, two and a half weeks there, where I had kind of a few major illnesses, surgeries to realign my neck, because it turns out that the impact had dislocated the fourth vertebra in my neck, which mean, meant it had severely crushed the spinal cord when it dislocated, which then just caused the paralysis, leaving me at that point completely unable to move anything from my neck down, really. But now it's a bit better. But yeah, at that point, it was obviously very scary. There's a lot of things going on. I was flying back to England where three weeks intensive therapy. Um, then after that, I just went my way through the hospital, another six months till the moment I left then after that it's all just I guess been trying to kind of get out in the real world and, and live my life again I went back to school and tried different things and it's kind of brought me around to to this point now so I mean what's quite nice now is we're what 11 years on now from from the accident so so we can talk you've always been very good at talking pretty openly about it and and we've all got a lot better with it but you obviously Talk about it there in a fairly kind of blase way of you know just trying to get back in the real world. There's obviously a there was a lot between the accident and and kind of getting your head straight with it all. So one of the things you talk about in in your book and in your keynotes is this kind of terminology of accept and adapt. And you know I think the hoodie you're wearing now has has you know got it on, and we're all wearing the Henry Fraser brand. We've all got the t-shirt. But um, can you just explain more about those two words and kind of what they mean to you and, and how you use them to get yourself in a headspace where you could move forward with things. Yeah, I mean, for me, obviously, early on, it was, there was a lot of challenges, obviously, to deal with, knowing that, obviously, I was fitting out as a 17-year-old boy and suddenly I've had that whole kind of physical side of me, which I guess kind of defined me quite a, bit, a lot pre accidents. So suddenly I had to kind of uh, reevaluate things and understand kind of my way going forward and for me that was um I was obviously having to accept what had happened in my situation and kind of the acceptance bit doesn't automatically happen it's not suddenly a, a kind of a switch and you fully accept what's happened and there's definitely stages of acceptance along the way and I think it probably took me a full 13 months where I'd fully accepted but the small stage of acceptance along the way allowed me to understand my situation much better and allowed me to move on. It wasn't a denial thing, it wasn't me saying, 
oh, this hasn't happened, I'm just going to do something. It was understanding that it had happened, realizing that things had changed, which then allowed me to kind of step back and look at, okay, well, moving forward, what can I do now to, to kind of cope with this situation to deal with it? And that was there. That's where the adapt bit comes in is, you know, suddenly I'm having to find new ways of doing things, new options. And yeah, I mean, I, and it's something that I guess now is just kind of naturally just in my head because I've just thought about it so many times. I've just practiced it so many times. It's just something that pops up with me. There's situations all the time where, you know, I'm having to, in my head, kind of ask myself the question, okay, why has this happened? What's happened? Why, why is this thing happening? And at the end of it, I always find out these two kind of answers of one, you know, if it, there's nothing I can do about it, I'll drop it, move on. But then if there is something I can do about it, then I will adapt to it and I will change it and I'll work my way through it. And yeah, it's pretty much, I guess, most days that I'm having to find things. And there are little things a lot of the time, kind of very small and meaningless in a way, I guess. But you know, those are just the things you, we all have to deal with each day. You you talk very well about kind of your your philosophy behind acceptance, and but it's not something that just just happened. You know, because I think a lot of people when they they hear you're accepting adapt, and, and it makes perfect sense for a lot of people. But accepting things isn't necessarily an easy. You just you just understand why, and then you move on. Because you had a moment, didn't you, where kind of it almost forced you to ask yourself those questions and then accept off the back of it. Yeah. And for me, it was, um, I guess for me, yeah, because I was thrown into a kind of really kind of tough situation. And suddenly, I guess I had no other choice than other kind of went two ways. And I was, um, where the day I was put into the wheelchair for the first time, mm. and it was the day that um, I was taken around the hospital, Kind of beautiful end of summer day, it was warm, taken outside, it was with the physio, my mum, well, our mum. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I hope, I, but it should be our mum, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I hate to break it to you. But, um, yeah, well, I mean, we look freakish alike, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so with mum and one of my friends, and we went outside and we're about to come back in, and, and that was the first time since the night before my accident, I'd actually seen myself, I'd seen my reflection. And I was, I'd lost four stone by that point. I was big bulk wheelchair, so I had the tracheotomy in my throat um, with an oxygen tank attached to it and couldn't support my own head, this big headrest, armrest, big bulky chair. And it was the first day, that, that was the first moment that I ever questioned kind of why me, why has this happened to me? Why, why are these things going on? Because I guess until that point, because I'd been lying in bed the whole time and Obviously, I'd been unwell, and I knew, I knew what happened to me, mm. but I hadn't really, I guess, realised actually the extent of, of everything. And so I always had that seed of denial, I guess, in my head that, you know, I'm going to get up and walk out of the hospital in kind of a year's time, or whatever. Um, so that kind of really pushed me to think, okay, well, this has happened, and it was a really bad day, and it was, it made me kind of rethink, okay, well. You know, I need to accept what's happened. I need to move on. I need to start looking at things in a different way. And for me, I was just, it was focusing on looking at things that I was still able to do. I was still able to kind of push myself in the gym. That was my, I guess, comfort zone before my accident. So I want to make it the thing that's going to drive me this time. And mm. I tried to turn to those things like you guys with family and friends, turn to those things that were comfortable with my kind of, those things that made me feel like, okay, this is fine. I can get through this. And, you know, we all have to find those, find those things that I guess we enjoy that we have in our lives that maybe we kind of didn't realise how good they were before, and it then helps you. Yeah. It, those kind of things will come together to help you accept what has happened. And then, so, so kind of taking it from from your story and your situation, when you talk to people about acceptance, because acceptance is is quite a big word, and it's very um, unique to an individual in the situation they find themselves in. But what advice would you give to someone who finds themselves in a, either they've had change in their life or they've gone through a bit of adversity, however big or small. When you talk about acceptance, what would be your advice to someone to start that journey? Because it's not, 
it's not as easy for everyone as it is it is for other people so what how do you begin to accept the situation to then be able to adapt to it i mean the first thing and it kind of i guess sounds a bit obvious is actually that realization that you are in a in a tough situation you kind of you you know that things aren't right you know that things have to change and i think that's a big part of it is understanding that because first step in the first step of acceptance um and then once you realize that and then you can i think realizing it as well opens up i guess a lot of emotions a lot of different things and again it's okay it's like those are natural things to be scared to be fearful to have those things in tough situations is fine and it's good to feel them not not deny not deny yourself um those emotions at all um and then once you kind of once you again once you realize that once you get through that point it's then okay then starting to look at okay well this you you guess you kind of just have to tell yourself well this has happened i need to i can't change what's happened but i can change how i react to it i can change how i'm going to move on and deal with it and again how you deal with it varies you might try something it doesn't work you might try another thing it doesn't work and it's just trying to find your own way and it's having patience allowing yourself patience in these situations to understand kind of what you need and what who you are in these moments mm -hmm. patience is so key and without that you kind of you'll always want it to change suddenly you'll always want it to mm -hmm. be there straight away but that doesn't happen yeah it doesn't happen it is a process it is a long-term thing that you have to mm. you have to stick with and it's it's amazing really because it it's amazing the impact it has on other people as well so with your situation you know obviously obviously you're the one mainly affected for obvious reasons but being uh, like you know i remember for all of us as well it was a, an awful time but actually once you'd made peace with it and you'd accepted it actually then it makes our life a hell of a lot easier because it generally got to a point where we're saying well, we can't be upset and down about Henry's situation if he's trying to, if he's accepting it and trying to move on because then all we're doing is is pulling you back so then it actually forces us to go okay we need to accept this now and and adapt with Henry and I think for other people you know very rarely are you alone in whatever you're going through and when you talk about the acceptance actually you accepting things helps the people around you to rally around you and, and help you move on with whatever it might be and i think at the moment it's probably very applicable for for kind of mental health problems people are having and suffering off the back of you know what, what we've all been going through so so once you've done you kind of accepted the situation this is it you had the moment where you, you saw yourself in, in the wheelchair and and it always feels weird me asking this because i kind of know the answer but <laughs> But then you talk about adapting. So when you've accepted that you're going through, you're going, right, I need to now make a plan. How am I going to adapt to this? But not only, because you didn't just adapt to it and manage it, you, you've actually, over the period of the last 10, 11 years, made the best that you can in the situation. But obviously that's further down the line. So in that moment, what was your kind of high level plan of, right, this is the adaptation that I now, this is how I'm going to adapt to this situation. Well, once I had that day, it was obviously for me, it was about thinking, okay, well, I'm, I'm still in hospital. I still had a long journey down the line. It was, I guess that day came shortly after, I don't know, maybe a month after mm. I've been told I'd most likely be in hospital for a year and a half. Um, and for me at the time, obviously, it was a lot to take because it's a long time in hospital and I was only 17 at the end. So for me, once I had a really bad day, my thought okay well my goal I want to get out of hospital as fast as I can but then realized actually that's miles away there's no point in me thinking about that there's no point in me focusing on that because you know that's a really like huge goal that's and kind of the further I'm away from that the more overwhelming it could be the more I feel like I'm failing and I'm not doing things right and it then it kind of drags me down so I thought okay well to get there I need to get to the rehab ward okay and let's get to the rehab ward I need to get off the ventilator and I need to go to get the ventilator. I need to do, I need to start kind of working hard at my exercises. I need to start kind of push myself with these things. And it, from what was obviously kind of an 18 month stay, suddenly reduced to six, I was out six months later. And that was only because I didn't think about the end goal. 
the end goal, the 18 month end goal, was, I got back down to five minutes in a single day. And those little building blocks, those little goals I set myself, the little progressions, those trying to be each five minutes each day more off the ventilator and breathing independently. And all those things suddenly make the end goal come to you much faster. Because you're not focused on that. You're focused on just the little steps along the way. And again, that's all part, yeah, part of the adaptation, having to work things out yourself, going to go, I guess, kind of think on the spot in each situation will be different. That was what I needed to do, so that's what I was going to do. Yeah, so the, so the plan, as you say, was, was the big stuff, wasn't it? The plan was getting out of hospital, the plan was getting off the ventilator, was, but then you drilled it down. So, and, and essentially, it's the title of your, the, your, your first book. Yeah. A list of big things, isn't it? it? It's, and almost little big things, but you start with the reverse. So you figure, okay, what are the big things? And then funnel it down to go, well, what can I do in this moment right now that makes that big thing slightly more achievable and more attainable? Yeah. But go, think, through, go on. I'd say, because those, as well, the little steps along the way make that kind of last bit so much more special because the small bits you, the small things are kind of easily attainable. Are me though, I knew I'd hit those goals every single day. Um, but I enjoyed them and it was fun and kind of recognizing those things. Suddenly, when I got off the ventilator, it was this much bigger thing than I thought mm. it ever would be. I just thought I'd get off it and boom, done, move on to the next one. You know, we enjoyed the moment, we made sure we had that mm. accelerated in a way. So, yeah, I mean, those little bits are, are big. Yeah. And what did it, so again, it's one of these processes where when we talk about this stuff, it's very easy retrospectively and in hindsight to talk about the quite matter of factly and be very kind of like, well, this is what I did and this is how I did it and this is what it gave me. Obviously in the moment and for people watching this, you know, again, it's very circumstantial for everyone that, that's listening. So when you're thinking about, and I think this is true for lots of people, when you, you have this big picture, that's potentially sometimes quite overwhelming. You know, for you, you're going, well, I'm lying here, and, you know, we all remember it well. You're like, I'm lying here in intensive care or on a ward. Um, I'm still on life support, and I'm thinking about getting out of hospital. You know, that could not seem further away. Mm. So, again, what was the process? Then did, was it a very natural thing where you just kind of naturally went, okay, well, in order to get that, I've got to start working backwards on what I can do now? Or was it a conscious thing of going, okay, actually, if that's my goal, then today I need to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, I mean, initially, the first thing in my head was I want to get out of hospital. Obviously, I want to go home. I want to be out. And then it was, yeah, then it just came to me that suddenly, well, okay, that's just, okay, yeah, what, what are the steps I need to do that along the way? Because, yeah, well, like you said, think about the end goal, think about getting out, getting home was big, was huge, and it was over, um, definitely overwhelming and it's yeah breaking it down to those smaller parts and I think it is you know, having those big goals especially the big ones at the end kind of it's great to have goals in life it's great to kind of have those things and want to achieve those things but it shouldn't be at the detriment of being able to still enjoy things you're doing and still being able to like live, live in the moment and do things because if my main goal was just get out of hospital it would have just been Okay, I'm just going to kind of put my head down, focus on these things. I'm not really still enjoy. I'm, I'm still enjoy the time with you guys and friends and everyone who came to visit me. Because having those little goals each day was just okay. I could focus on that bit, and then boom, done. That was it. I can enjoy the rest of the day. I can, I can relax as much as I can. I can do different things. Um. So yeah, I think we got to. Goals are great, but you kind of got to. I guess move move the post each time to yeah. fit around you to still be able to live your life and enjoy enjoy the process along the way. And, and ironically, it's that being able to enjoy it, which ironically make, make me makes your goals more attainable mm. because you actually put yourself in a better headspace. So when we go to that that point of view as well, we talk about the mental health side of, of your situation. Now, for those of you watching, it will surprise you when I tell you that. Henry was more an anxious person before his accident than he is the years afterwards. He was a, a soppy, 
mummy and daddy's little boy. And ironically, I'd say you're more independent now than you were before. Um, but in terms of that, so, so this whole focus is a very, pro, a very kind of process driven way of looking at things. Mm. And, you know, various stuff we've been reading around being present, being in the moment, mindfulness. Focusing on the little things is, is kind of the actionable stuff from that because you're not worrying about the big thing. You go, well, what, what can I do now? So for you, in terms of your mental health, do you think, again, in hindsight, having this mantra of the little big things, do you think that helped your mental health when you're going through this process, or do you think it didn't make a difference? Um, definitely. It's, um, yeah, like you said, obviously, I used to, kind of, big situations used to kind of always overwhelm me. I'd always, I'd always feel the heavy on me. I never, I never dealt with them very well. Um, but yeah, having this has allowed me to definitely kind of re reevaluate and um, rethink how I look at, at life and my day to day life in a way. And I can easily look back and think about kind of all the things that I guess I took for granted before in terms of <laughs> physical capabilities and other things that I was able to do before that obviously just didn't make the most of. So now it's, I try and make the most of each each kind of big moment I get, but also the little things in my day, the kind of little joys I have in my life. I mean, there is, um, obviously there are still so many things I kind of physically can't do, but there are still things each day that I really enjoy, the kind of obviously the work I do, um, you know, just enjoying, I guess, a TV show or a good book or things like that, even if it's just for half an hour or something where I can sit back, relax and just enjoy it, even if it's something I've read before, water for just I know it'll make me happy and I'll kind of really make sure I kind of revel those moments and enjoy it and make the most of it. We've spoken about obviously your accident and your big change in mindset around accept and adapt so which is kind of the plan then the detail of that plan which is essentially having the big goals drilling down into actually what can you do today now you kind of said it yourself but within all of that there's obviously things that you can control there's obviously things that you can't control so again talk us through that process so how would you go about having this because you've got a very explicit understanding of actually what's in your control and what's out of your control now again was that a very natural thing that you almost learned on the go or was that a deliberate thought of saying i cannot i don't want to waste my time and energy worrying about things that don't that i can't influence i want to focus entirely on what i can yeah, I mean, I guess um, for me, part of it was definitely in hospital where I just feel there was a lot of uh, a lot of stuff you're told in hospital is just stuff you won't be able to do. There wasn't this kind of huge, um, this huge thing on focusing on still what we were as patients and as people were still able to, to do. Obviously, they wanted to help us get kind of fit and healthy, but it's kind of, I didn't kind of enjoy kind of what they were saying. So I wanted to just focus on things I could do and yeah I mean I guess it took a little while to kind of always get that in my head and again it's having patience and it takes time to kind of that repetitive nature of having to keep telling yourself why well, I can still do this I can still do this um so yeah I think and it's definitely something that I guess because I did really so early on that after that it was just became a natural thing for me to keep keep looking at those things and when I just keep looking at things I can do, the things I can't do don't kind of enter my head anymore. They don't, they're not there. They're not things I ever really think about at all because I just drilled myself into thinking that way. Um, so again, yeah, it's, that's just part of the process and all these things are processes. They are, yeah, part of it. And yeah, like I said, it's just things, you've got to have patience again. So when, all these things we've spoken about, we've obviously focused them around almost your recovery from the accident. So, you know, these little big things you spoke about in hospital acceptance situation when you're, hosp you're in hospital. That was obviously 11 years ago now. And since then, you know, you've, you've gone on to brilliant things and, and done some, had some awesome moments of which, you know, we're all hanging on to your coattails in the slips, just trying to catch free events and all that sort of stuff. Um, have you taken, obviously the, these, these mindsets and mantras and the ways you think about things are obviously key to everything you've done since your accident. But are they still conscious 
things or are they very subconscious so do you actually deliberately have moments where you think i need to refer back to um understanding that it's in my control or is out of my control or you know or accepting that or do, does it just naturally happen now i think it just naturally happens now and as well because i think i kind of understand myself a lot better in my situation um i guess pretty well um I'm not really in situations now where I'm not getting myself in situations where I'm having to kind of think like that again. I try and kind of have really a great control over my life and the things I do and what I do. Um, like, I mean, I've got, obviously, for example, like care, there's obviously, there's, you know, I need living carers and stuff, but I'm not having them think for me. I'm not having them kind of control what I'm still able to do. I'm, I'm so able to be me, make my own decisions, kind of be tenacious, kind of be quite in training and in physio and do these things. I'm still able to control those things and do those things. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess now it's just, yeah, those things just don't mm. come into my head anymore. Um, so, yeah, it's just the focus that I put in early on, all the work I did, those little things early on have just become such a natural part of my day-to-day -day life, I guess. It's almost trained yourself. Yeah. To be, um, which is amazing because, you know, so much, so much the stigma around, I suppose, uh, mental health and mindsets is this thing, you know, you can train your body, beat, but no one trains the mind. And kind of you're living proof that actually, yeah. telling yourself these things and thinking this way, it's almost like a muscle memory thing. You, your brain just, when you're in a situation, you just defer back to these, these ways of thinking. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, the kind of pre-accident and post-accident me's are, are these, I guess, that kind of the embodiment of those two things. And before the accident, my whole focus was just, you know, I love being in the gym. I love just kind of pushing, pushing a bit of weight around and doing those things. Shoving some tin about. Shoving some tin about. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I've never really kind of thought about my mental kind of state of things and kind of, I guess, the anxiety I was feeling at times and, and all those things. Whereas now, obviously, the complete reverse. I don't have anywhere near those physical capabilities. Yes, I'm able to do some things that I still really enjoy, but I have to keep a lot of it in my head. There's a lot of things that I'm having to kind of deal with day to day, and I've just had to train that and keep focusing on that and going through those things to make sure I can keep control of my life and, and who I am and what I want to do in my life. It's, it's weird to, you're probably weird for people to hear, but it's almost like, in many ways, what you've lost physically, you've gained mentally. Mm. Yeah, 100%. I've just had to revert all that meathead gymnast into my actual head this time. Um, but then, but we, and people are watching this, you know, and will still be in some form of, not locked down, or, but we're still obviously heavily in the, this pandemic and there'll be various restrictions on what we can and can't do. And I suppose your story is, at the heart of it, is, is how to make the best of a bad situation. Um, and yours is obviously a very extreme example of that, but I often talk to people when they ask me about you, um, which isn't as much as they used to, you'll be shocked here. That's a joke. It's yeah, too much. <laughs> um, you guys are sick of it. Yeah, I am, really. I can't believe I'm even doing this with you. Like, it's just, yeah. Um, but, um, but I often say in many ways, and we've spoken about this plenty of times, we'd all obviously give everything for this to have never have happened. But equally, in many ways, you've made opportunities for yourself that you would never have had without the accident and the way you've dealt with it, which is a really weird thing to kind of talk about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, for me, it was one, it allowed me, one of the big things it gave me, the accident, I guess, was to kind of really hit home that I thought about kind of all the opportunities that I had that I never took before the accident, all the things that, you know, I could have done and should have done more with. And suddenly now I guess got this like second chance to, mm. when these new things pop up in my life, I can take them and, and get on with them. And, you know, do something with them. And having that kind of shock moment, that realization to step back and suddenly think, oh, 
maybe I need to think differently. Maybe I need to do this, which is what, you know, this whole, I guess, lockdown COVID situation has given a lot of people now is that space to kind of separate themselves from their life, which they were just getting on with, but I guess not really thinking about so much, not really kind of taking in what they were actually doing and the little things, I guess, they were missing along the way. Once you have that space to kind of look around and suddenly go, oh, wow, this, you know, I've got time to do this and do this. I can try new things. And yeah, it's tough. Lockdown is tough and because it's, we're suddenly thrown in a situation that we don't know. We're separated from each other. We're still able to connect in certain ways, but it's, it isn't the same. But to have that step back and take that breath and look at your life from, I guess, on the outside again, can help you, you know, move on and do better things. And like you said, you know, the stuff I've been able to do with this, that newfound feeling for me of trying new things and taking opportunities has allowed me to do kind of, yeah, amazing stuff that, <laughs> yeah, I never would have got anywhere near had I, had I not had the accident. So how do you, what are you saying to people that you're right, if, if, if this pandemic's given us one thing, it's time to think isn't it? And reflect. And so what would you say to people that have had that time to think and reflect, have thought about changing something in their lives or trying something new or finding a new part, whatever it might be. It's one thing to think it. And then there's something that entirely new thing to actually do it. Mm. So what would you say to people that are struggling to make that leap from thinking about it to actually doing it? Well, I guess, again, it's reverting back to the goals and the process again of finding something. I don't know if some people realise, I guess, maybe the job they're in, they're not enjoying, they suddenly realise, oh, maybe I want to try something or whatever. It's thinking, OK, well, how can I do this? What can I do to to achieve that? And, yeah, I mean, trying, I don't know, it's, it is, um, yeah, I don't know, it's, lockdown's a weird one, having that, that, drive to want to change that um that will to want to do it i guess has to be strong you've got to you've got to really want it to change it i guess um so hopefully people will have realized when they do realize it is setting those challenges those goals those little steps the processes again and you know i always everything you know i seem to talk about always does revolve around again those little big things those those moments, but you know, they are so applicable in so many different things we do in, in whatever we do for any of us. And it's just, again, that reminding yourself of those things, that constant, even if you're writing it down each day, writing something down and reverting back to it and thinking about it. And you know, those, those, those find those are good little tools to help people. And when, obviously, when you do your talks, when people get in contact with you on, on social media or whatever it is, um, you know, you're inundated with people giving you every kind of word of praise under the sun and, and on all this kind of stuff. And whenever people talk to me about you, and, and a lot of the time people hear you talk and they'll say, oh, you know, I'm never going to... I'm never going to moan about my life again. I'm never going to do this, this, this. And I always say, well, you're, you're taking the wrong thing from what Henry's saying. It's not, yeah, as you said early on in this conversation, you know, emotion's a good thing. You need to moan. You need to have, otherwise you're just going to keep it in and explode. Hmm. What I take from everything is this sense of perspective. So it's not that you should never moan. It's have that, you get out. But then once you've done that, how do you then react yeah and what, what's the next thing you do from it that's kind of what i've always taken from it when you do your talks what is what is, is kind of the key message you're trying what do you want people to leave the room having heard you talk what do you want to leave them think them to leave thinking i guess i want them to leave thinking differently about well yeah definitely about how they I don't know how they feel about, I guess, what they, not, uh, no, not what they do, but just think differently about how they, I guess, approach life, about how they think about each day. Um, and not always about how they think about each month, each year. It's about how, how they appreciate most of each day and each moment. It's, um, 
because for me, one of the big things I want people to take away is kind of gratitude. And like you said, when people say, oh, I'm not going to moan because Henry's doing this, and gratitude isn't kind of being grateful, comparing yourself to someone else's life. It's not about going, oh, I should be grateful for this because someone else doesn't have that. Or, but it should be grateful to say, oh, I have this. It's not going, I've got this, someone else doesn't. It's about going, oh, well, I can still do this. I can still kind of enjoy this. I don't I'm, even, I mean, for me, <laughs> Like, one of the big things for me is, obviously, as you know, my body, now I can't control my body temperature. So whenever the sun's out, I can't spend, so I don't spend a lot of time outside because most of you in England, it's too cold. I'm having to wear thermals and layers and things. So when I'm able to just sit outside in the sun and enjoy those moments, I'm just, mm -hmm. I've like, I'm never more grateful any time, more time of the year when I would just sit out and enjoy the heat of the sun. And it's only, most of the time, I can only do it for 20 minutes, half an hour, because it's too hot. They have to come in and blast a fan on me for an hour. But, you know, it's enjoying those moments and relishing those things and really making sure you make the most of it. And again, it's the little things. We want people to enjoy those little things each day because when you really kind of look for them, when you make sure you train yourself to focus on those things, you kind of really just enjoy the day so much more. You have kind of a whole new perspective on kind of how you're living, I guess. And yeah, that's how I, I want people to feel. Brilliant. And it's also, I can, I can vouch for you enjoying the sun because you become like a lizard. It's like you're cold blooded and you just sit in the corner. Jealous of my tan, that's it. Let the sun hit you up, yeah. Really um, jealousy. <laughs> well, I look unbelievably pale in this. Yeah, yeah. Well. Um, so kind of to, to start to, to, to wrap up then, and what you said there is perfect. Everything we're trying to do, as I said at the start, is, is take the learnings from these incredible experiences that people have and bring them into the context of the individual, team, organisation, whatever it is. And you said in your last couple of answers around how applicable the way you think is in any walk of life. You know? And I think what you say there about gratitude is, is bang on. It's so unique to the individual and, and it's not about comparing at all as you say it's with all these things it's taking it and adapting it to you mm -hmm. and putting it in your context yeah taking inspiration from people like you that have done it in a much more severe situation than touch wood anyone else will have to go through but then taking it and putting it in your life so what would be and we've kind of gone through it but if you were if someone came to you and they were struggling and obviously it depends on what they're struggling with, but kind of take COVID. What would be your advice to someone that's struggling to get their head around the changes their lives on the back of COVID and get back into work or get back into whatever it was they were doing before? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I don't know, it's, again, I'd, I'd say, I mean, first of all, I'd ask them was kind of where there are any moments where I guess that you kind of really enjoy in lockdown, were there any kind of moments you, you had fun? Were there any moments that you kind of thought to yourself, maybe this isn't so bad? Or, and then, then it's about kind of reminding them of those times and think, well, you know, this situation was, you maybe there were bits you enjoyed, there were things you can kind of look back on with joy. And it's about then kind of only focusing on those things that you've happened rather than going, we spent six months not really doing much or, you know, probably haven't eaten as well as I should have and all those things. It's about just, again, looking back at those good moments and thinking, okay, well, maybe this wasn't so bad. Maybe, and again, it's not denial. It's not kind of denying this has ever happened because we can't. It's kind of, kind of lurking with us for a long time. But, um, and then it's thinking, okay, well, once those have got you in a better mood, I, I think, then you can start thinking, okay, well, I need to go back to work, but what do I need to do to get back to work? What do I need to do to make this kind of comfortable and easy for me what and then it's just about you know doing those things and I guess like I said being open and honest with people with I guess the people you work with the people you work for maybe saying well you know maybe I need to do this maybe I need to do that and I think you being honest with those people will allow them to I guess kind of empathize with you a bit more because and I think they will now and I think that's one of the great things that come out of this that you know businesses and I guess kind of bosses and staff and everyone will realize you know we've all been through 
there's one thing that we've all experienced together. It's not my experience was me as I'd experienced it. Obviously, we experienced it all together as a family, as a as a group. But this is everyone. This we we all know and go through. And I think having that great understanding together of what we've all been through will help us. And I think hopefully, again, touch wood will help people give people a better understanding of each other and connect better. And yeah, I think hopefully part of me would always hope that out, out at the end of this there will be some some good change. There will be kind of different attitude towards each other, towards kind of how we work and how we live our lives and things. And you know, yeah, there have been a lot of dark days with every everything that's gone on, but you know, there's always there's always hope there'll be some good come the end. Cool. I think that's probably a very apt point to uh, to wrap this up on. Um, H, thank you very much for for taking the time. Uh, to everyone watching, I promise you, next time we talk to Henry, he'll have a much better haircut than he does now. The roots will grow out. <laughs> um, cool. And uh, you'll be seeing much more of Henry uh, with 101st as we, we kind of grow and progress. But H, thank you very much for your time. And, uh, Cheers. Yeah, you too.